you. Open your Bibles for preaching this morning to the book of Colossians chapter 1 and verse 13. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 13. We're just about on the tail end of the series. We've got one more uh, lesson that we'll be looking at, a message we'll be preaching next week. We've gone through the relationships that are more than just a Savior. A wonderful book that was written by Stephen Benefield, and I've enjoyed preaching them, the lessons, and I believe that God has used them, and uh, my prayer is that God will use today. This is the last relationship, and it's interesting how it brings us back to the initial relationship, God being the Creator. In Colossians 1.13, the Bible says, "...who hath delivered us from the power of darkness..." and hath translated us into the, what's the word? Kingdom of his dear son. And so this morning I'm going to be preaching on the relationship of king and subject. We are his subjects. We are in his kingdom. And we're going to look at the differences this morning in the kingdom of God, in the kingdom of heaven. There's just some confusion that's been... Uh, over many years about what those two kingdoms are and what, whether they're physical, whether they're spiritual. We're going to go into that. This particular relationship specifically is about the kingdom of God. And we're going to look at the importance of that. Um, and uh, I believe everything that we've, we've talked about today, getting the gospel to a lost world, everything, all of it, um, is, is ties in perfectly with what we're going to be doing this morning, our teaching on this morning. So let's bow our heads for prayer and ask God to meet with us as we look at this wonderful relationship between God and us, the relationship of king and subject. Our Father, we ask this morning that as we open the engrafted word, that God, you would put your spirit upon it, Holy Spirit, that you would be in our midst, that you would confirm and that you would stir our hearts as we look at the pages of this blessed book. Pray that you would illuminate your word this morning and help us, Lord, to understand, give us clarity of mind. And as we preach this morning, we pray that you would help give the congregation listening ears to hear what you've said to the church this morning. Again, we thank you for the privilege of serving you. And God, we ask that you would help us as we look at this relationship to desire and to challenge ourselves to be better subjects in your kingdom and to reverence and revere you as truly the King of kings and Lord of lords. In Jesus' name, amen. If you'll turn in, 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 as a matter of introduction <clears throat> this morning to the book of Revelation chapter 4, verse 11, Revelation chapter 4. We'll get into the relationship in a minute. Uh, I want to read some verses as a matter of introduction. Look in verse 11 of, he of Revelation chapter 4. It says, Thou art worthy, O Lord to receive glory and honor and power. For thou hast created all things, and now look at this, it says, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. Now by the way, that's exactly why we as his people were made to look to the king, the greatest king of all time, the most supreme king ever that will ever be, because he has a heavenly kingdom as well as an earthly kingdom called the kingdom of God. And he, is, uh, he, he looks to us for his pleasure, to be his subjects in his kingdom, to do his bidding and to please him as his subjects. That's the responsibility as subjects to the king. Turn from there to Psalm 95, the book of Psalms, chapter 95, leaving your finger... In, uh, well, actually, you don't have to worry about leaving your finger in anything because uh, we're going to be covering th through a lot of verses. Psalm 95, verses 1 to 6. The Bible says, O come, let us sing unto the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving and make a joyful noise unto him with psalms. Interesting that we, we just had the Thanksgiving season recently and what a blessing it is to be thankful and it's important to be thankful to God. Now look at verse 3. For the Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods. In his hand are the deep places of the earth. The strength of the hills is his also. The sea is his, and he made it. And his hands formed the dry land. O come, let us worship and bow down. 
That's usually what you see with a king. The subjects bow down. There's a humility in the relationship. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your heart as in the provocation, as, as in the day of temptation in the wilderness. Turn, if you will, from there to Psalm 74. Back a few pages. Psalm chapter 74. And verse number 12. David writes, For God is my king of old, working, what's the next word? Salvation in the midst of the earth. You know what God's all about in the kingdom of God and His kingdom? Seeing people saved. Amen. That's why He established our relationship as king and subject, so we who are part of His kingdom, the kingdom of God, can invite others into His domain, into His kingdom, from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light, from the kingdom of being lost to a kingdom of being saved, amen, and being able to serve Him for all of our life until He comes to take us to permanently live with Him on this earth, the kingdom of God. We're subjects serving the greatest king who has ever lived. John 18, turn if you will to the book of John, chapter 18, verse 36. John chapter 18 and verse number 36. Jesus answered, now he is before Pilate, he's being tried. This is just before Calvary. After this trial, a door will open to the street and he will be drug down that pathway and ultimately will fall under the load of that cross and they'll grab a man, Simon of Cyrene, and the two of them will make their way up to Calvary. And he will be nailed to a cross, and he will suffer and bleed and die for us all. Listen to his comments to Pilate during the trial about his kingdom. Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight, that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now is my kingdom not from hence. Because the kingdom of God, folks, is in you and is in me. He takes up residence in our hearts. He becomes, we become his habitation. The Bible says, what? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit which is in you and which ye have of God and ye are not your own? Therefore glorify God in your body and your spirit, which are God's. And so the kingdom of God is the work of God that he, 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 he performs in your heart and in my heart the day we get saved. That is what the kingdom of God is all about. It is a spiritual kingdom that he has established within you, and yes, it's in your physical being. He lives in you. Aren't you glad? I love 1 John chapter 5. The Bible says in verse 11, and this is the record that God hath given to us eternal life. And this life is in His Son. He that hath a Son, that means in your heart, He lives in you. He that hath a Son hath life. And he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. Be before we are saved, we are in the kingdom of, of darkness. And the, the only direction of our life in that kingdom is eternal death. But when we trust Jesus... He gives us eternal life in a kingdom that is beyond anybody's imagination and wildest dream. Because the ultimate destination, not just the kingdom of heaven, which we are going to participate in, but the ultimate destination for those who participate or become a part of the kingdom of God is to live with God eternally in the wonderful New Jerusalem. Amen. And I'm looking forward to that one day when the king of kings comes, puts, us, puts down all of his enemies, and takes us permanently to be with him. So what is the kingdom of heaven? Turn to Daniel chapter 2, verse 44. We've established that the kingdom of God was, is, is within us. Go to Daniel chapter 2 and verse 44. We're going to go to the scriptures today, and we're going to look at the difference so that you can wrap your mind around 
um, the, the different terms. And when you read these different things in the Bible about these two kingdoms, you'll be able to identify, okay, well, that's, that deals with me. That deals with me being saved. And the kingdom of heaven deals with the future millennium. Daniel chapter 2, verse 44. And in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. If you study scripture and you go back and you look, God is actually going to destroy this earth. He's going to destroy the, the heaven presently, and he is going to start all over, and we are going to reign with him a thousand years on the earth, but that kingdom will, will not stop. That kingdom will continue. It's a wonderful kingdom, and it is established as a promise to David that he would have an everlasting throne, and the Lord Jesus Christ sits on that throne as he rules. So what are, what are the roles in this kingdom? First, let's back up a little bit. And let me look at, let's show you some contrast between the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God, if you want to make, just write, if you've got a piece of paper, I'll flip your bulletin back on the back, and if you can make a little chart if you want to. Under the kingdom of God on the left, and then the kingdom of heaven on the right, here's what you can write. The kingdom of God is spiritual. Because it's the work of God, and by the way, it is the work of God, not of work, not works of works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy, He saved us. For by grace are you saved through faith, and not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So the kingdom of God is a spiritual work God performs in your heart as you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Amen. Kingdom of heaven, rather though, is physical. There's going to be a throne, and Jesus Himself is going to sit on that throne, and he will rule, actually, he will rule from heaven. Heaven ruling the planet Earth. And so it's a physical kingdom that God himself will continue to rule with throughout. It's a wonderful kingdom. We will participate for a thousand years, and then we'll be ushered into the, millennial, into the New Jerusalem. The kingdom of God is present. It's right now. The kingdom of heaven is future. We don't know when. I, I loved uh, a comment that J. Vernon McGee made this morning. I was on my way, and I just happened to listen to him and um, caught an excerpt, and he, he mentioned this. He said, we, we, nobody knows. He said, the, the thing of the day is to speculate when Jesus is going to come. And he made an interesting, interesting statement. He said, we, we use the expression, he's coming soon. He said, find that in the Bible. The Bible does not use the term, he's coming soon. It says, behold, I come quickly. And the word quickly is a time frame. It could be any time. We don't know. Now, he said it could be. Now, that message that he was, it was recorded, that he was preaching just before the year 2000. And you remember all, what all that was about, right? The world was coming to an end, and the moment the computers went from 1999.999 to 2000, everything was going to go to the boogeyman's house in a handbasket, okay? And what happened is, is it didn't happen. And all the, everybody for years, and it's been throughout, throughout time, everybody's been predicting when Jesus was going to come. We don't know when he's going to come, but here's the thing. He, he made this statement. I thought this was really good. He said, we need to plan as though he will never come and work like he will never come, knowing he is. Here's what happens. People decide that he's going to come, and so they, he, he was in a church in Texas. He mentioned this. This is an illustration. He was in a church in Texas, and when it came time to build a facility, they decided that they, they were going to build a temporary facility until they, somebody got their, their minds squared away that Jesus might not come in 100 years, Okay? Maybe he, maybe he might come uh, several years from now. And he said, wouldn't it be now today a pretty ridiculous thing to have a temporary facility 50 years later? Okay? So he, he, people do so many things with, without the, with the understanding that Christ is going to come when he may not come in our time. He didn't come in Paul's time. didn't come in any of the disciples' time. He didn't come in the early first century church's time. 
And he hasn't come yet, but a thousand years is as a day with God, the Bible says. And so we know we're to be ready. And we as subjects are to serve in his kingdom for however long he lets us live and commit ourselves to serving God in the kingdom of God. So the kingdom of God is spiritual, not physical. It's present, not future. And the kingdom of heaven is future. The kingdom of God is the promise to every man. Aren't you glad that whosoever will may come? He didn't, de he didn't delineate rich, poor, young, old, red, yellow, black, or white, green, purple, blue. Okay? It doesn't matter your nationality. It doesn't matter your age. It doesn't matter your social status. It doesn't matter how much money you have. Everybody comes to the foot of the cross and humbles themselves in faith and trust in Jesus Christ. And every person has an opportunity. Whosoever will may come. Amen. Be, the great B.R. Lakin, I heard him preach once when I was a teenager, was probably the greatest preacher on heaven that I have ever heard. He loved the subject of heaven. Another thing I used to love to hear him preach is about evolution. He was, so, he, he, was, he was very, very funny. He was very comical. And he just ripped evolution to pieces. But in his, I heard him speak, and in his message he said he felt that when we get to heaven, that as we look at the front gate, it's over the top of the gate going to say, Whosoever, whosoever will may come. And as we walk through and we look on the back entrance of the gate, it's going to say, chosen from the foundation of the world. That's a good balance. That means that God has chosen us because he knew who was going to be saved based upon our faith and trust in Jesus Christ. But he always gave everyone an opportunity.